I have a bad feeling about this. We're going to play a bunch of Star Wars games. The movies were a prime target for video game adaptations. They were full of all kinds of action set pieces, with battles taking place in space and on land, lightsaber duels, speeder bike chases. They had lovable characters, great storylines, and a classic mythology that was ripe for expanding upon in the world of gaming. So how could they f*** that up? Let's find out. Our journey begins, innocently enough, with the Atari 2600. This is the first Star Wars game, or at least the first Atari version, based on the first movie. It follows the same format as the arcade version, which came out before. It focuses on only one scene from the movie, the climactic rebel attack on the Death Star. It's unimpressive, to say the least, but for the time, it was ambitious to try and create a 3D perspective. And besides, the Atari 2600 is well known for not being able to live up to the arcade standards of quality. The Empire Strikes Back, again, only borrowed from one scene, the fight against the Imperial Walkers on the planet Hoth. Unlike the other game, this follows the two-dimensional side-scrolling format, similar to games like Defender. All you do is shoot down an infinite army of walkers while avoiding their laser beams. Did that blast just come from its... Are these walkers, or are these dogs out airborne turds? They take a lot of hits. You just keep shooting them till they change different colors and eventually explode. The control is fluent. The longer you drive the joystick, the more momentum your ship gains. Return of the Jedi focuses on the second Death Star battle. It figures out of all the scenes they could have chosen, they go with the space scene. You know why? Because Atari loves space. The best way to describe Atari in a nutshell is spaceship shoot laser, boom, that's it. Just the amount of games that begin with the word star is overwhelming, or damn, space. What was this, the f***ing space age of gaming? If this game wasn't called Star Wars, it would just seem like any other Atari game. The controls are similar to the classic Asteroids. Even though I said they picked the space scene, there actually was another Return of the Jedi game that focused on the Ewok stage. That's one way to make more money, split them up into two different games. However, the Ewok game was never released. The object is to get closer to the Death Star so you can destroy it. But unfortunately, there's a giant dance floor in space stretching out for infinite light years. You have to wait for a hole to appear, go in the hole, and now you've engaged the Death Star. Going with the dance theme, I think this would be a better game if you were trying to destroy a giant disco ball. Yeah, the storyline is that disco is coming back and you gotta stop it. It would be called Disco F*** Yourself, but now I'm just thinking out loud. So you keep shooting away at the Death Star, blasting away all the pieces, hoping that you can make all the pieces go away before all your brain cells do the same. Once you have a clear shot for the center, it's time to go boom. It's gonna go boom. This is Atari, I know. It's gonna go boom. Boom! There is another game called Jedi Arena. It's supposed to be based on the scene in Star Wars A New Hope, where Luke is training with that flying metal orb thing. So you're waving your lightsaber back and forth, deflecting electric charges. I guess the idea is to deflect them to the other player, or the computer. Um, hmm. The best way I can describe this 
it feels sort of like playing pinball when the ball is stuck somewhere and you just keep jamming the flippers back and forth in vain. There you have the Atari Star Wars games. Not so good, but it's Atari, so it's excusable. But now we're moving on to the Famicom. This game was only released in Japan. It never came out on the NES. You know that could mean one of two things. Either it was the only good one, or the worst of all. Let's see. The cutscenes are promising enough, until you get to the gameplay. Luke has black hair? Even though it's blonde in the cutscenes. Oh, never mind. Let's get on with it. I'm dead. Already. All it takes is one hit. Couldn't there be a life bar? Oh, this lightsaber sucks. It goes right through the enemies. You can only hit them when they're really close. Oh, come on, I jumped over that. You're telling me if I'm anywhere near a projectile, I get hit, but when I'm trying to hit an enemy, I have to be precise. That's real fair. So now I'm inside the Jawa Sandcrawler, murdering some stormtroopers and birds? Now I'm fighting Darth Vader? Already? He's inside the Sandcrawler because why? Oh well, who cares. Did that happen in the movie? Did that happen in any of the movies? Did Darth Vader say to Luke, I am your father, and I am also a scorpion? No, it's not true. That's impossible! Why is Darth Vader turned into a scorpion? That doesn't even happen in the special editions. There is no version of Star Wars in this universe or timeline or any other, I'm sure of it, where Darth Vader turns into A scorpion. I need a beer. Hey, where's my beer droid? Hey! Come on, bring me a beer. Yeah, that's my beer droid. Hey. Alright. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright, come on, come on. The next stage, you're in the land speeder mowing down stormtroopers. Well, this is easy. The stormtroopers can't even harm you with their laser blasts. If you hit a wall, you lose the land speeder. But other than that, you're invincible. Okay, so I guess he's going into the Moss Eisley bar. That's the famous scene in the movie where Luke meets Han Solo. But one thing I didn't know was that they allow land speeders in the bar. What, does Luke just crash his way in? It's quite interesting, actually. In this version, Luke gets to the bar so fast, I bet Han and Greedo were still talking at, at the table. You know, who shot first, Han or Greedo, whatever. But actually, neither one of them did. Luke kills Greedo with his land speeder, right after Han says, over my dead body. Boom! All of a sudden, Luke comes through, crashing with the f***ing land speeder. I want to see that in the next special edition. Now we're already flying away in the Millennium Falcon? You don't even get to see the inside of the bar. We've already established that this game has nothing to do with the movie, so at this point, I'd just like to see what kind of ridiculous could go on in there. But no, we don't even get a cutscene. Nothing. After a pitifully standard space shooter stage, we're back to side-scrolling again. Game over. Is that Darth Vader breathing? Or is that the sounds of the ocean? Now I start from the beginning? Yep, it's one of those games. No continues, three lives, one hit deaths. Simple as that. You make three mistakes, you go all the way back to the beginning. There's little in the way of one-ups. No password system, and no stage select code. Doesn't matter how far you get, if you die, you're doing it all over. Even on the novice setting, it's still hard. The odds of successfully navigating through this miserable keep is 3,720 to 1. There's certain Jedi powers you can use to help yourself through, but you only get these for a limited time. The only way to progress is through trial and error. You need to familiarize yourself with the layout. 
Like here, I thought I could jump down that waterfall, but nope, that's the wrong way. Each time I play this, I progress a little farther than the last, but if only I didn't have to keep playing the earlier stages over and over again. After the 20th time, I'm burned out. This is worse than a piece of It's a whole The NES got a different Star Wars game. Hold on, no LJN? It's a movie-based game, it's on Nintendo, and it wasn't made by LJN? Then it might have a chance. It starts out with a driving stage. It would be nice if you could just point the speeder in the direction you want to go, but it has to have that backwards control, like Roger Rabbit and Dick Tracy. I hate that It also happens to be one of those where the do I go kind of games. If you haven't played the game before, you can spend hours searching for the right place. The first time, I had no clue I'm supposed to go straight to the sand crawler to find R2-D2. Once inside, it turns into a side-scroller. Luckily, it's a huge improvement over the Japanese version. The controls are more fluent, and you actually have a life bar. Thank God. It still manages to be a very difficult game. One thing that's kind of annoying, if you fall from too great a height, you take damage. Does that happen in Super Mario Brothers? No. It doesn't. You find these elevator shaft things that make Luke shoot up into the air, but they land you on a conveyor belt, then you get hit by these metal garbage can lids. Those conveyor belts can go There's R2! Oh, the conveyor! Then you drive out to Moss Eisley to find Han and get the Millennium Falcon. Here, there's actually a stage inside the bar, unlike the other game. It's unfeasible to beat this stage with the blaster. You have to get the lightsaber before coming here. So f the bar, first go to the cave. Yeah, it's some cave where Obi-Wan gives Luke the lightsaber. It's not clear at all where you're supposed to go first. And besides, why would Obi-Wan give Luke the lightsaber in a cave? Now that I have the lightsaber, the bar stage is much easier. But the next stage starts kicking my ass again. All these bounty hunters are flying around blowing me to smithereens. Ah! Uh, jump! Jump! Ah! Uh. I made it through the hangar. I'm at the Millennium Falcon, flying in space, getting annihilated by asteroids that kill in one hit. You gotta collect shields for the ship, which can only be found back at the hangar. Of course. Too bad I didn't know that, because now I gotta do the whole game over! Okay, so I went through the whole game again, and now I'm back at the hangar this time making sure to collect the shields. Now the flying stage is much easier, and after that, it's time for the Death Star. Unfortunately, the Death Star is a confusing maze of elevators. Where do I go? Wouldn't it be nice to have a map or a compass? Anything to help me navigate my way. Instead, it's a guessing game. Man, I don't know how the stormtroopers deal with this <laughs> Even worse, one of the elevators can only be found by taking a dive. Try that anywhere else, and it would drop you to your death. Once you get Leia, she becomes a playable character. Fortunately, she can jump way better than Luke. But it's not going to help too much, because this whole stage is full of spikes! If you touch them, you die. That's it. Even if you touch the side of a spike, you die. This is a cruel joke. Think about every game that has spikes or any sort of prickly hazards that cover the walls. Imagine all that combined and multiplied a million times. Even worse, you go into this anti-gravity room where you get sucked up to the ceiling against your own will. Ah! Ah! Mm. Man, the only way to beat an outrageously difficult game like this is to cheat. Like I hear a lot of people use emulators with save states. You know, that would be pretty handy, I guess, but you know what would be better? How about just a button you press that makes the game beat? And that's why I invented the beat a game button. Yeah, all you do, if you're playing a really hard game, you just push the button and the game's beat. Let's try it out. Ninja Gaiden 2. Ooh, that's a hard game. Oh, man. Oh, I'm getting my kicked. Legend of Zelda. Beat it. Mega Man. Beat it. You never thought you'd beat a hard game like that. 
Not without the beat a game button. All right, all you games, consider your beat. All right, back to Star Wars. Rusty hunk of junk. Ow! Empire Strikes Back is our next game. It starts out in Hoth, like the movie. Luke, what's this? The lightsaber is the weapon of a Jedi? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for interrupting the game to tell me that. Might as well tell me cows go moo. For the most part, this game sticks to the same format as the first Star Wars on NES, but the controls still take some time to get used to. It doesn't help that you start out riding on a Tauntaun. You can get on and off, and if you get off at the wrong time, you can get stuck. Until I found out you can jump higher by first holding down. It's like Super Mario Bros. 2, you duck down and it charges your jump. That would have been much more useful information to tell me, instead of, the lightsaber is the weapon of a Jedi. And what's this? The program engineer shows his face? I wish it was Fred f You can collect different force powers. Look, choose the force. Instead of use the force, it's choose the force. That's clever. Though I gotta give him credit for the digitized speech. Sounds better than Ghostbusters. <laughs> Even Darth Vader's breathing sounds accurate. For some reason, the Tauntaun eats this nasty fungus on the ground. Mmm, yeah, yummy, eat that <laughs> Whatever it is. The part where I get really <laughs> is when I'm trying to jump on these glaciers, and these droids keep shooting from all over the place. Aiming the blaster is not as self-explanatory as it looks. You think you just point with the D-pad, but no, it just shoots wherever the <laughs> it wants. Now I'm fighting the Wampa. It takes like 9 million hits to kill. And look how easy this is. I could just stand here and he'll never get me. Next is a flying stage where you shoot down the Imperial Walkers. You even tie them up with the cable, like in the movie. Then you're inside the Rebel base where you can hijack a walker. The strange thing is that Luke actually destroys it before hopping in. I saw it explode and collapse, but now it's perfectly operational? Then you're in the Dagobah swamp. Enemies pop out of nowhere, and the vines must have been greased with oil because I keep slipping off. And of course, there's that classic bull where you have to leap off a ledge in good faith. This swamp stage is from hell. Oh my god. And that's where I reach my limit, because the game's too hard. There is no Return of the Jedi game, not on NES. I guess they knew when to stop. Hey, beard droid. You know what? Just never mind. To be fair, the NES games aren't that bad. They have decent graphics, music, and are somewhat faithful to the movies. If it hadn't been for insane difficulty, I wouldn't shake too at it. The difficult nature of the Star Wars games was like a tradition that carried into the 16-bit era. On the SNES, there was the whole trilogy, and the force is strong with these ones. These were called the Super Star Wars games, rightfully so. From the beginning, they look and sound just like the movies, although on the main menu screen of the first game, Mark Hamill's face is a little messed up. They follow the movies well and take liberties only when necessary. You'll recognize all the famous scenes from the Hoth battle to the duel with Vader. You even get to play as the appropriate character for each stage. Luke, Han Solo, Leia, Chewie, even Wicket the Ewok. There's a nice variety of side-scrolling stages, 3D flying stages, 2D flying stages, and POV flying stages. The voices are great too. You, Mortar not. there is no try. The bosses are huge and always keep you wondering what's going to happen next. It also has one of the most awesome attacks in any side scroll. You can perform a double jump and spin the lightsaber around. I find myself using this move all the time. Interesting to note that in the newer Star Wars movies, you see the Jedi doing this kind of thing more often. Sometimes the action is so intense, it's like blast processing. Oh no, Chewie's going nuts! Chewie's going nuts! The only downside is that it is extremely difficult. Even on the easy setting, these games are relentless. In the first game, there's this land speeder stage where you're going around crashing into piles of 
a series of tricky platforms that require some lucky jumps, false jumps that lead to nowhere, enemies that take way more hits than necessary, come on, f die, power-ups that come way later than needed, descending platforms that make you think you're going somewhere but take you into lava with no warning, enemies that freeze you over and over, and boss battles that go on for an eternity. Why do all these bosses have such long life bars? There is a frustration factor, but there's a balance between frustration and fun. These games are mostly fun. They can be annoying, but they're annoying enough that you still want to keep playing. Shadows of the Empire on Nintendo 64 was when Star Wars games started getting really good and showed that there was a bright future for more games in the franchise and that they didn't always have to follow the movies exactly. They could invent their own side stories and expand on the Star Wars universe. This game, for example, takes place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, though it begins with Empire. The battle on Hoth was amazing. For the first time, we really felt like we were playing the movie. We've come a long way since this. Things have changed. We have taken a step into a much larger world. Of course, we had to stop somewhere because there's a whole galaxy of Star Wars related games. So this could have gone on and on. There's Star Wars Rebel Assault, Dark Forces, Jedi Academy, Rogue Squadron, Battlefront, Star Wars Chess, Lego Star Wars, Star Wars Puzzle Blaster, Star Wars Pod Racer, Jar Jar Binks Bingo, Death Star Builder 3.0, Chewy Wookie Cookie Cookin', Stormtrooper Tennis, Jabba's Farts Unleashed, that was a good one, Wedge's Wedgie Attack, Fishing for Akbars, Super Sith <laughs> Toss Tournament Edition, Boba Fett's Name Game, Find His Name in the <laughs> Movies, Governor Tarkin vs. Count Dookie. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! What the the f buffalo just took a f through my f window! Oh my f there's sh glass all over the place! Where the f did that come from? Oh my god, I gotta clean all this up! What the